Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 72, Science Faction half Neum. Just not ready for the full Neum. Just, I can only get a half. It, it is only half DM. We use these for control rods and nuclear reactors. Uh, not much more because it's really hard to split from zirconium. It is also the only element discovered by a midget. <laughs> <laughs> the half man. Yeah. Most just usually name it after themselves. Yeah. He actually just named it after a racial slur for his people. Well, a community of people. They finally found something to do on that seven and a half floor in that New Jersey office building. <laughs> <laughs> I am your host, comedian and archaeologist, Robert Timothy, and with me, as always, is my biomedical research scientist, Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing tonight? I'm okay. I was feeling kind of tired, but now that I'm here, there's something about you starting this podcast up that just gets my juices flowing, you know? It's like a punch in the dick. Yes. That is what it's like. I'm sure of it. And speaking of somebody who's both punched and been punched in their dick a record number of times, none other than our comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing tonight? I'm um, doing great. Would be doing better if the show didn't counteract the roofies I put in Jackie's drink. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you had a plan. I'm sorry. Yeah. You should have told me. I would have gone with a more mellow vibe. <laughs> it's fine. I'll just masturbate. <laughs> Well, okay. Hey, so it turns out this will be like every other show. <laughs> Guys, we're here at the world famous Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of the beautiful downtown San Diego. It is just gorgeous out here. If you have not gotten a chance to come out to Madhouse and see a show, uh, we we tape in the late afternoon where there's beautiful blue skies. But once mm-hmm. the shows go on at night, you can see all the stars. You can see the bright lights of the skyline of downtown San Diego. It is an awesome place to watch some comedy. Come out here and check it out. Also, while you're hanging around throughout the week, wondering whether your scientifically illiterate ass can figure out the world around you, <laughs> go ahead and log on to our website at thescienceFaction.com. Once again, that's thescienceFaction.com. The. With two E's. With one E. <laughs> With one just e. one E. Literally sabotaging <laughs> your only chance at stardom here. One E. <laughs> thescienceFaction.com. We're using it as a science news aggregation site. You can go there and basically find out any interesting news that's going on in the science world. Check out our science blogs. Check out our podcast itself. And pretty soon we're going to be putting up some... Some, uh, neat free artwork for you to check out. So uh, going out to thescienceFaction.com. Your place for science and an additional E. No, nope. no, nope. it's not an additional nope. E. Science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Guys, the latest saga in one of my favorite science facts about the universe and the history of the world. Very, very interesting. Of course, the history of Madagascar. We've dis- oh, that's, that's a good one. We've discussed it a few times on this show before. It is super interesting. So Madagascar is an island 200 miles off the southeast coast of Africa. But it remained completely unpopulated up until about 2,000 years ago when people on boats you know, came on over and settled the place. They, however, didn't settle it from Africa, which was the closest body of land. They they settled it from the other side of the Indian Ocean in Borneo (laughs) because they were fucking Polynesians. Yeah, badass. Isn't that insane? Polynesians got on a boat in Borneo. (laughs) The same guys who are heading out to Hawaii and Rapa Nui, and they end up coming over west and hitting Madagascar and populating Madagascar, one of the most interesting yeah. parts of archaeological history to me, something that I'm always really interested in. And to date, one of the most fun historical road trips. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much a road trip, though. Well, uh, sort of a boat trip. I mean, yeah. Yeah. A little known fact, the migration of Polynesians from Borneo to Madagascar was actually the historical starting off point for the script of What About Bob? <laughs> <laughs> that movie finally makes sense. <laughs> A researcher was looking into dog genetics, and he wanted to see how much of the Indonesian dog that Polynesians brought everywhere with them survived in the DNA of these Madagascar dogs. He'd done previous research in other places the Polynesians (laughs) went. Sorry, this is a really terrible sequel to Reservoir Dogs. (laughs) Polynesian dogs? (laughs) No, Madagascar dogs. (laughs) Polynesian dogs is the third one where it all comes back. It's a lot more depressing. (laughs) It was actually called Two Dog, Too Furious. (laughs) He'd been doing some research before in different places that the Polynesians had gone and checked out the percentage of DNA of their Polynesian dogs in those populations. And it varied, but it was always there to some extent because they brought their dogs with them wherever they traveled. In this like good owners. You don't leave your, no, yeah, you don't leave your dog locked your up pet. in the boat. No. Yeah, no. With you can't, the window up. a pain in the ass to put a kennel in the boat, you know. <laughs> so they uh, were doing DNA tests, and they look, and they found out there's zero 
Indonesian dog DNA in Madagascar dogs, meaning that th those dogs did, had no relation whatsoever to the Indonesian dogs. In fact, they're 100% related to the African dogs on the continent. So these Polynesians sailed across the world, always taking their dogs with them, made it to the island, and yet when they got there, instead of using their dogs, for whatever reason, adopted the dogs of the mainland 200 miles away. Very, very interesting. We have not found this in any other Polynesian settlement, so something unique happened here. Hmm. So wait. Madagascar was not settled by the people of mainland Africa, but it was settled by the dogs of yeah, mainland was, Africa? Yeah, it was like, wow. <laughs> like a dog. Mainland I, I Africa doesn't get lapped. <laughs> <laughs> so why did this happen? Did a lost group of Borneoians end up there without their dogs, and the only way they could get another was from the mainland? No, it turns out that can't be, because we know from population genetics of the Polynesians themselves that there were fresh infusions of Polynesian blood, indicating a long-term trade in people with other Polynesian cultures. Yes, that means they not only settled the other side of the world, they commuted. <laughs> <laughs> so they commuted. I they were going to say they fucked their dogs. <laughs> they went back and forth, and they had people coming in from other Polynesian cultures to theirs, individual human beings breeding in, adding new genetics. But for whatever reason, those groups also did not bring the dogs, and those dogs also did not come and breed in. There was something about this particular culture of Polynesians on Madagascar that they broke the trend and did not use this Polynesian dog and instead adopted the African dog. So why no dog infusion as well? The answer may be that the voyage was long and daunting and the dogs were the first to be eaten, which apparently happened most of the time. <laughs> it could be that the dogs made it but were ill-suited to the environment and died out. It could be that the settlers just liked the African dogs more. Whatever the reason, a very interesting chapter in a very cool genetic story. Yeah. All right, guys, a couple of questions for my panel. Number one, what is your theory as to what happened to the dogs? So I think this is a, a lost in translation issue. So the dogs were fucking Scarlett Johansson? And the Polynesians, such great seafarers, Polynesian dogs are sea lions, guys. It's all a misnomer. Okay. Oh. So they were there the whole time, and they still are. <laughs> so they're a flipper print in the sand next to mine. Yeah. See, they were always there. Yeah. You could see how they could be confused. You know, when you look back in the sand and you just see one set of flippers. <laughs> that's, that's right. It was then that they carried you. <laughs> <laughs> Damien, what's your theory as to what happened to the dogs? I think Madagascar, like Australia, has very strict policies about bringing pets into the country. You mean uh, like they have, they have native oh, they species, customs. like Johnny Depp's <laughs> unfortunate yeah. mishap this they, past week? They like uh, they don't care if you're Polynesian Johnny Depp <laughs> or Polynesian Joe Blow. You're not bringing your fucking dog on the island. I think the real question we're missing is who let the dogs out. Right. <laughs> By the way, that was the title of the article that was written. So congratulations, <laughs> you have the same sense of humor as a hackney science writer. Question number two: <laughs> The Polynesians. Who do you think listens to this show, Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> the Polynesians conquered vast oceans found insanely remote land masses, occupied areas across more than half the globe, and built dominant, thriving cultures. What do you think made them so successful? I don't know if you've ever seen Polynesian dancing, but those hips, you know how Shakira's hips don't lie? Uh -huh. I think Polynesian hips don't fuck around. Okay. All right. Damien? I think the same skills that come with island hopping and uh, settling are the same you mean, skills like, for that a make guy you... You're not really into? <laughs> <laughs> Is island hopping like something I'd like? Is that, what some, is that like a gay trip? Like, is that my trip to the Philippines? I'm going island hopping, guys. Is it possible, though, that the same skills that, that lend themselves to island hopping also lend themselves to being a professional NFL football player or fighter? Maybe the Polynesians are just that much more fit. Yeah. They're okay. Huge, so they're just they're just better, just badass dudes. genetically better. Yeah. Uh, sorry, guys. No, the correct answer is you would explore, too, to get away from those women. Oh, number three. <laughs> this is the type of gritty real world reporting that's missing in fluff documentaries like DreamWorks propaganda piece Madagascar 2. <laughs> Please use. Not to be confused <laughs> with Madagascar 1, which was a triumph. <laughs> I think the, we've been clear about that. Or the hours of fluff documentary that I have shot at home. <laughs> <laughs> Please use this science article to make an equally baseless and outlandish claim. <laughs> what if the early Africans were really mean to the dogs of Africa? Okay. And so basically I'm thinking of a Moses story okay. where like dog mm, Moses oh, yeah. says, let my people go. Okay. And then uh, splits the sea and takes them to Madagascar and then only for them to be enslaved by Polynesians not that longer. Uh, let me modify that a little bit. What if... We took away the Moses reference to not another great man in history. He also got them because the Africans were treating them poorly. And he promised not to cuss or hitcha. 
And so when he pulled up quick to retrieve them, <laughs> he came with them back to Madagascar. They'd rather stay in play. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so much of this could really be attributed to dogs, can it? It's back in the day when uh, rappers were knighted and royalty. <laughs> All right, let's move right on to article number two. Article number two, warm-blooded fish. Scientists have discovered the first warm-blooded fish, which makes what Damien does not so weird. Oh, so there's fish who constantly bring up a comedy competition? <laughs> yes. <that> they just <laughs> well, didn't, they, didn't do well in, but somehow need to bring it up. Let me tell you something. Basis. You yep. might not think fish talk, but they'll be able to replicate any sound they hear as they're being brutally, brutally sexually violated. <laughs> And that is what Damien talks about during coitus. <laughs> just like I've been raving about on this podcast so yeah, far. To this, I'm th- thank you for keeping me from just rambling on about this competition. You're welcome. All You're fucking welcome. episode. We've been, you dicks. We have to like take turns now. It's exhausting. You have to take turns yeah. belittling me about a competition. You know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fucking win this next year. We already knew of the existence of this fish, the moonfish, but since it spends most of its life in waters up to 1,000 feet, we knew basically nothing about it. We know that old fish are cold-blooded, but that's kind of a misnomer because the truth is that large fish like tuna or great white sharks, if they exert their muscles enough, that makes heat. They don't have mm-hmm. the same kind of endothermy system we have where their body constantly stays hot, but if they're flexing and, and basically using their muscles, they will warm them up. Shaking that ass. If they shake that ass, it gets hot in here. But they're still cold-blooded. They're not going to call you the next day. That's right. <laughs> Girl. However, that heat also usually quickly dissipates. Other large predatory fish spend time near the surface in warmer waters to help warm them up because, and this is part of the way biology works, muscles, whether they're ours or fishes, work better when they're warm. Mm-hmm. So if you warm up your muscle a little bit, you can move quicker. That's why a lizard bathes out in the sun, and that's why it's really slow until it warms up, and yeah. then it can get very, very quick. Bathing in the sun, much less efficient than water. <laughs> Bathing in your own sweat. <laughs> well, so these guys, because they're warm blooded, can essentially stay low into those deep waters but still be really fast. These fish actually have a heat exchange between warm blood coming out of their muscles and cooler blood coming in through the gills in order to maintain a body temperature five degrees higher than the outside water, which is quite impressive. We've seen heat exchanges in other animals like Arctic foxes and penguins, but never in a fish. This is really, really interesting. Some might even say changes the definition of what we call a fish if you have one that's endothermically warm-blooded. Now, by Arctic fox, do you mean like Siberian supermodel? Because, I mean, they're warm-blooded creatures we expect to see. Oh, I see the confusion there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, she's it's, wearing like a mink. It's because of that Kate Upton Sports Illustrated cover. I was actually referring to the fox affiliate in the northernmost part of Alaska. Uh, oh, Arctic fox. Yes. They're incredibly conservative, by the way. If you think regular fox is conservative, <laughs> try Arctic fox. It's a Sarah snow. Palin network, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> their motto is, we like snow because it's wider than those N-words. That's what it is. That's their... <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's the wow. Arctic fox's message. Okay. You better get there, Hillary. <laughs> the war on snow mist. I'm tired of the, Inu- <laughs> the Eskimos coming in here telling me I have to use more than one word for the day of snow outside. <laughs> Okay, a couple of questions for my panel. Question number one, very cool convergent evolution of endothermy. Obviously, it's separate from the one that mammals went through. What other previously unknown abilities will we discover that some fish have? The ability to talk with Aquaman. It's just as amazing for a fish to be able to talk to a man as it is for a man to be able to talk to a fish. Mm, Probably more amazing. Wait a second. What if instead of Aquaman, what if they had Tetra fish? And (laughs) and that one fish could communicate and apparently control like people and other (laughs) land animals. What does he have to say to a man? Please give me other fish. (laughs) Or plankton. Yeah, (laughs) depending. We don't know what genus this is. We're going to have to do some research. I mean, if we're going to have a dialogue with this fish, we should at least know something about it. We have to be open to whatever their needs are. I'm alone and scared. Are you part of my school? (laughs) What do you think uh, is another previously unknown ability that we will discover some fish have? Yeah, magic. Just magic. Like they can play Magic the Gathering? (laughs) <laughs> no, that's stupid. <laughs> no, that they could perform magic. Like, okay, what kind of magic? Thinking more like Penn and Teller kind of magic, not so much Lance Burton. So wait, are they doing like wizard warlock magic, or are they doing like complex illusions like Penn and Teller? Yeah, yeah, no, like Penn and Teller. <laughs> oh, they're comp. Right, you know what? That's even more impressive than that's magic. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Magic the Gathering. Listen to this asshole. <laughs> Question number three, why are these the only known fish with this advanced an endothermy system? What makes them different? It's the moon. Oh, because they're moon fish. Mm, yeah, no, it's... They the get their power from the moon. Like women. 
Women get their Women power. Getting their power <laughs> you guys get your power. <laughs> Damien, <laughs> destroy the moon. <laughs> Tired of this bullshit. We've talked about this on the show. How, like women think they're like so connected to the moon. This show is going to be broadcast from the poles. We're changing every six months. <laughs> we will be doing nothing but listening to Arctic Fox <laughs> and whatever the penguin equivalent is. <laughs> All right, guys, let's move right on to the misreports. The misreports, where we tell you how wrong you are. Bringing back the old Miss Reports with the Ken Ham intro. We haven't used that one in a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we believe we got him on this show? It was an interesting guess. It was. That's, I don't it's think. A, it's an Easter egg for, you know, everybody wants to go digging way back in the archives. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, guys, you might have seen this article all over the science news sites. It's probably one of the most popular ones right now. A bunch of people actually messaged me about this show to do this article. Uh, oldest stone tools ever found date back to 3.3 million years ago. Or more accurately, if you read past the title, 3.1 to 3.3 million years ago. Oh, go fuck yourself. <laughs> All over the science news sites, here's what's cool about it, and here's what's being misreported. So following is the cool part that's really legitimately neat, and, and it should be exciting. Uh, come on. Really legitimately really neat. Really legitimately neat. Yeah. And you've also abused the word cool and interesting several <laughs> times on this episode, and, and throughout the history of this podcast. And I've let it slide, but fucking wow me. How about just neat? I'm sorry I gave you the charity case of calling you cool once. I didn't realize <laughs> I had damaged the brand. <laughs> So, guys, the story goes as follows. Researchers working in Kenya have located the oldest stone tools ever found. They're 3.3 million years old, beating out the previous oldest stone tools ever found, which were 2.6 million years old, which technically fall into the chronological range of the genus Homo. There are nearby fossils of similar date of the species Kenyanthropus platyops at 3.3 million years ago. Now, Bobby, way back then, can you identify a tool by seeing how many Nickelback CDs they had in their collection? <laughs> Is that how that's done? <laughs> you could do it both by that and Raiders jerseys. They, okay. Those were the two scientific ways to figure mm, it out. Okay. So even though it was found very close to the species Kenyanthropus platyops, we don't know for sure that it was from this particular species. I'm because just making up words. Because this was a crazy world of different hominins running around, including Australopithecus afarensis and probably a few other species we haven't found yet. He's definitely making up words. They actually discovered some Kenyanthropus platyops remains a few hundred meters away, but an, and an as yet unidentified tooth only a hundred meters away. So these are basically lithic stone tools that are made by smashing stones together. Some they found not only the tools and the hammer stones, which they use to hit the things that will eventually be tools, but also anvils, which means they're doing something called bilateral percussion, where they put a stone on top of a big, large anvil stone and then hit it with a third stone so it flakes from both sides. Now, would cavemen of that time take those anvils and use them to try to catch roadrunners? Mm, yeah. Keep in mind, not cavemen. This predates our own genus. I, I like how that's where you got hung yeah. up. Not the reference to a Warner Brothers cartoon. Well, fine, so a saber-tooth roadrunner. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> So very, very interesting, very cool find, and even cooler was how they got very specific dates with a mixture of dating techniques. If you got to go neg first, yeah. straight up neg. <laughs> well, they first they went match.com, but they yeah. also did Tinder, yeah. so they just mixed yeah. it up a little bit. By the way, that was two abuses of the word cool prior to that joke. <laughs> Uh, this is cool, so go fuck yourself. This is very cool. <laughs> Up to three. <laughs> they started by locating a well-known layer of volcanic ash that had been repeatedly dated to 3.3 million years ago, located below the artifact. So they essentially know it's no older than 3.3 million years old, and we know how old this one ash layer is. They then took magnetic samples of minerals in the dirt below, within, and above the layers that had the artifact. So they got dirt that has magnetic minerals in it, from all places around the artifact. Man, that is so cool. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> they knew... The I owe you an apology, <laughs> sir. What did they do with the dirt, Bobby? <laughs> since the Earth's magnetic field switches throughout time, and since we've documented the history of those switches really well through work done around the world, we have a sort of calendar of when the Earth's magnetic field is pointing one way and when it's pointing another. These periods in between magnetic flips even have their own name called crons. Right now, we're in a normal polarity cron because victors write the history, bitches. <laughs> yeah, in your face. <laughs> Man, that was cold. But we are overdue for a flip to a reverse polarity cron. These flips, on average, happen every 450,000 years, but the last real one was about 750,000 years ago, so we're a bit overdue. Because the other one was fake ash flip. <laughs> this <laughs> one's real. Keeps it real. The Earth's magnetic field is what guides a compass. You know, we all know that. It, it flips back and forth about every 450,000 years. We've talked about that on the show. We have. And interestingly enough, there was actually a brief 
flip 41,000 years ago, only 41,000 years ago, but instead of lasting for 450,000 years, it only lasted for 440 years. That's that fake-ass flip um, I was talking about. <laughs> so it, it was. It was a fake-ass flip. It flipped, and then it stuck, and then it was like, ah, oh, fuck this, I'm out. And then it, it was like a thousand-fold off in its mouth. As certain minerals are formed, they will cool with their iron elements aligning to the Earth's magnetic field. So by looking at that alignment, which is what they're doing when they're looking at those magnetic minerals, and referencing that calendar, we can tell quite definitively that the artifacts are between 3.1 and 3.3 million years old. I repeat, very fucking cool. Mm. That is that is pretty awesome mm. that you can see Earth's minerals cooling, figure out the magnetic field of the Earth at the time that they cooled, referenced a known Weeps. chronology of that cooling and those magnetic alignments and figure out when something existed. That's too many definitions of cool in one explanation. Yeah. Cooling, cooled, is cool. Go fuck yourselves, yeah. it's awesome. No, Fonzie. Fonzie's cool. <laughs> what this was, was an abuse of the word cool. So very, very interesting science and worthy of praise and mention and all great, but a little bit of misreporting going on. So number one, a few... About the cool? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, are we going to do a correction segment about this next episode? <laughs> number one, a few sites I saw were claiming it's overturning old thought that tool use didn't come around until the homo genus. Shut up, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> The truth of the matter is that published research has been refuting that assumption for decades, and there isn't any real scientific support for that idea. We've thought for a while that some tool sites might be attributable to Australopithecus species, so no great science gestalt switch here, especially because, issue number two, while amazing and interesting and totally awesome, it also doesn't push the date of stone tool use back in the archaeological record, which is what a lot of the sites were claiming. While these are the oldest tools themselves ever found, we have previously found evidence of stone tool use by cut marks on bones from 3.39 million years ago sites in Ethiopia. So it pushes back the oldest known tools, but not necessarily the oldest known use of stone tools. Very, very cool article, but not quite as sensational as some of the places we're reporting. Like you. <laughs> not as sensational. Is an older tool site like maximmagazine.com? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I think it's cool. All right, guys. Let's move right on to I Call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, guys. This is I Call BS, in which I read four science articles, some of which are real and some of which are BS, and my panelists try and compete to figure out which ones are true and which ones are bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Actually, I kind of got a perfect last game and, mm -hmm. and beat you the did. shit You did. You got a perfect. Did I, even, did I even have to play this week? You, you do have to play? I should have gone to I, I was I mean, supposed to go I to work for her job for the week. ton, mm -hmm. and I still had to play. Not a perfect. And I'm a master scientist now. I what? have had a perfect score in the past. I was just humble about it. I disagree. If there's, so, so, if there's one thing you've learned about me on the show, it's that I'm very humble. Oh, so I must have been imagining all that humble pie you've been forcing down my throat <laughs> after your winning streaks. That's an interesting name for the female genitals. All right, on to, <laughs> on to article number one. All of them. Scientists have announced that there is no known cure for white nose syndrome, a fungal infection that affects only bats and kills between 78 and 100% of populations affected. Article number two. Drinking chamomile tea decreases the risk of death in older Mexican-American men by 29%. Article number three. The first ever dinosaur fossil found in Washington State was recently discovered, and it's a T-Rex relative. And article number four. A new mouse model shows drinking alcohol in the early weeks of pregnancy, the equivalent of three to four weeks in humans, does not seriously affect the fetus. All right, guys. Jackie, you are fighting for blood. Let's see mm. who's got the best answers. Try and follow along at home and see what you think. Article number one, scientists have announced that there's no known cure for white nose syndrome, a fungal infection that affects only bats and kills between 78 and 100 percent of populations affected. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. Uh, white nose syndrome actually affects humans, and there's a cure. It's called rehab. <laughs> <laughs> It seems that the, that cure doesn't work so much. It seems like there's a lot of times when that cure doesn't really work, but there, it's really expensive. Recidivism is a part of rehab. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very oh, good. Man. And you, Jackie? Um, I think that this – I also think it's bad science. They're messing with – maybe you're messing with the word cure. I think there is a way to treat it per se. I, I think it's bad science. I think that they have found a way to fight this fungal infection. 
All right. Article number two, drinking chamomile tea decreases the risk of death in older Mexican-American men by 29%. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. Drinking chamomile tea does not increase the chance of death. It increases their chance of listening to their wives. By the way, decreased chance of death. But okay, well, good enough. Decreased. And also, by extension, beating the shit out of said wife. <laughs> Damien, this affects you as a mestizo yourself. I would think that you would be very interested in, yeah. in the results of I'm it. I'm not interested in not hitting my wife, so I'm not going to keep <laughs> drinking the tea. Oh, uh, and his possible future wife, Jackie, what do you think? <laughs> Ay, Dios mío. Um, decreased older Mexican. Yeah. I'll say this is science. I can't imagine that many older male Mexicans just sitting around enjoying chamomile just tea. Chamomile tea. <laughs> but, uh, but if you could get them to do it or anything, like stop hitting you, then yeah, sure, maybe it'll decrease the chance of death by gunshot to the face after the hitting. <laughs> Article number three. The first ever dinosaur fossil ever found in Washington State was recently discovered, and it's a T-Rex relative. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. He wishes he was a T-Rex relative. He actually was the much nerdier Triceratops relative. Why was the Triceratops nerdier? He's got the big horns. Yeah. Seems like well, he's pretty badass. Uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't read the article, but if this is the same article. Then they found evidence of it. He had his inhaler next to him, implying that oh, he had heavy okay. asthma. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pretty sure they found a report card next to him. Straight A's, mm-hmm. except for one <laughs> F in PE. Yeah, oh, oh man, that's, that's a hard a one. sign. Nerdy. All right, go ahead, Jackie. I also think this is bad science. I think you know, the T-Rex is too cool. Like, it's almost as cool as that article you were talking about earlier. Nothing's as cool as that article he was talking about earlier. I'm glad we all agree. On to article number four. <laughs> a new mouse model shows drinking alcohol in the early weeks of pregnancy, the equivalent of three to four weeks in humans, does not seriously affect the fetus. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and I have to hope it is. I, I That's just, exactly I, my answer. I need. I need this to be true. I just need it to be. I, this is one of those where I'm just. I take a knee. I just need it to be true. All right. So, that, so you're both saying true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. After okay. she, you know, copies my answer. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Let's see who won this, and you can go back at home and see how well you did. Article number one: Scientists have announced there is no known cure for white nose syndrome, a fungal infection that affects only bats and kills between seventy-eight and hundred percent of populations infected. Both of you thought this one was false, and this one is bad science. Right. They're actually using a soil bacteria-derived treatment to which the bats are responding really well. They're cautiously optimistic as they are just releasing these treated bats back into the wild. Hopefully they won't get that fungal infection again, and hopefully they can survive because we need bats, and this thing's fucking them up pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. And a related story, Bruce Wayne's getting over that cold he's had for the last (laughs) month or two. The one in rehab? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> article number two drinking chamomile tea decreases the risk of death in older mexican-american men by 29 percent damien thought this was false jackie thought this was true this one is bad science Woo! but it's true in older mexican-american women uh, not men so jackie at least you got I, that going for I you knew it was a technical yeah, at least win win high five <laughs> at least you can just drink chamomile tea and decrease your death rate by 29 percent so that's is pretty that, cool is that because it has some anti-inflammatory effects after the beatings Ooh, it actually does have some anti-inflammatory effects so apparently it decreases across all types of death so apparently it stops car accidents too but it, <laughs> it could if you're be, at home <laughs> drinking tea you're not out driving yeah, good, that's how that good works good point and it's not alcohol it could be an anti-cholesterol effect it has alcohol in it tea. has <laughs> anxiety lowering properties it has anti-inflammatories and antimicrobial properties it might just be correlational and it mm-hmm. equates to a certain way of life we're not sure but if you're an old mexican woman go ahead and drink some tea what if you're any other ethnicity is this just drink locked some... into to mestizos is this well obviously like old british woman would want to drink tea as would like old turkish women you know hey, well, i'd of... never oh, yeah. be called <laughs> dead with a chamomile i'm an old gray woman myself <laughs> Article number three, the first ever dinosaur fossil found in Washington State was recently discovered, and it's a T-Rex relative. Both of you thought this one was false, and this one was science. So we know that the West Coast, a lot of it was mostly water, which is why we have very sparse dinosaur fossils here. Here in San Diego, we have only three, all found by the same guy. So there's very, very few dinosaur fossils in areas along the West Coast because of that. This is a pteropod leg bone, which is similar to the T-Rex, It was found in the San Juan Island Archipelago in Washington State, and it lived around 80 million years ago. Very, very neat. Congratulations, Washington. You now have a state dinosaur fossil. Good job. And on to article number four. 
a new mouse model shows that drinking alcohol in the early weeks of pregnancy, the equivalent to three to four weeks, does not seriously affect the fetus. Both of you thought this was true for magic hoping sake. <laughs> and this one is bad science. Actually, because it's six months? Because it lasts the six? It's actually found to be the opposite. It actually induced many of the epigenetic effects responsible for fetal alcohol syndrome and changed key brain areas in the mouse models. Now, keep in mind, these are mouse models. They're not always 100% transferable. But we've talked before about how the rise in wine culture among young 20-something-year-old white women has increased their chance of having birth abnormalities mm -hmm. to the point where now wealthy, middle-class white women are having more birth abnormalities than much poorer women, likely yeah. because of that wine affinity. Mm -hmm. So this happens before most women know they're pregnant. And this apparently can affect you. Yeah, while you're raging yeah. and getting pregnant. That's right. <laughs> so this can this can this does have the possibility to affect the baby. They are recommending that women who are looking to get pregnant basically curb their drinking from when just, they're trying to get pregnant. To hey hoes looking to get pregnant. <laughs> Be warned. Uh, Smoke on that herb. Not only that, but they identified a bunch of the epigenetic changes that come from this that you know, contribute to things like fetal alcohol syndrome. And if you don't have a severe form of it, if you just have a mild one, they can still tell because they've identified these changes. And they're thinking of doing a thing where they basically swab every newborn's cheek to look for these epigenetic changes so that they can, you know, if it needs certain proteins or something, they could deliver mm -hmm. it. But you got to think about this. Like if it's having withdrawals, they can just start hooking up the IV to the vodka. Right. Or if it just has something minorly fucked up with its thyroid, you can adjust for it. But could you imagine every time a baby's born, the doctor comes in with that swab and it's just – it's like a drug test for the mom to see if she had any booze in the last nine months. And she's like, oh, God, no. Oh. <laughs> Didn't even know I was pregnant for the first eight. Yeah. <laughs> I have this baby on the toilet on TLC. <laughs> Congratulations, Damien, for winning once no. again this week. No shame in being beaten by the best, Jackie. No shame at all. <laughs> I guess that's true. When you're, well, when you're going I up guess against... that you must know that because of when I was beating you. I'm going to get like a belt that will say like King Science on it. I'll be, like, King the, Science. I'll be like royalty. Of the dog kingdom. He's the guy I call cool. That's right how on. you know. That's how you know. Let's move right on to finish my story. Finish my story. Where one of us has to complete the other's balls. All right, guys, finish my story is where our biomedical research scientist Jackie reads Damien and myself the beginning of a scientific article and we compete to try and finish it. Damien, are you ready to play? Winners always are. Let's go. <laughs> okay, well, as the resident scientist, it is my job to deliver the most compelling, interesting, captivating science out there. What about cool? To date. No, no. Bobby's got cool. <laughs> I have the others. Bobby's got cool. So that's why I am talking today about erectile dysfunction. ED, as I'll refer to it, is a phenomenon that Viagra commercials tell me affects over 40% of men over 40. Frankly, I think they're leaving out the 15% that are any age but just drink 40s, but that number is <laughs> yet to be confirmed. What do you guys think is the best cure for ED? Easy. Double Ds. Right? <laughs> right? ED for ED. <laughs> There Listen, you if, you wanna, if you want to ask how to actually fix uh, erectile dysfunction, it's one easy way. Yeah. And this, one, this is probably the easiest, simplest way to fix erectile dysfunction for men around the world. Yeah. You redefine the word dysfunction. <laughs> so if you redefine it, all of a sudden erectile dysfunction doesn't exist. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right? If dysfunction all of a sudden means raging heart erection, then erectile dysfunction is not what you have if you can't get a raging heart erection. Boom. Problem solved. A no of, more ED. A lot of people with dysfunctional families yeah. are going to get arrested. Just, just the way the law was written up. So, man, you have a rock hard family. God, <laughs> it was such a girthy, erect family. <laughs> you got really prominent veins in your family. <laughs> Does all of your family tilt a little to the left? Your family smells funny. <laughs> Is your family wearing a hood? What's that scab on the tip of your family? <laughs> <laughs> Looks really weird when your family wears those furry clown shoes. <laughs> I see semen runs in your family. All right, Damien. How do you think they can fix ED? They. The prostitutes. I don't know, but if you ask any guy named Ed, he wishes they changed the acronym. What about Al? <laughs> What, what, what is Friend Al? Al. <laughs> that stands for anal lesions. That's worse. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a pill for that, Ed. Uh, <laughs> At least you have a pill. <laughs> well, you guys have some great suggestions. Well, Bobby had a good one. It's, it's better. Anal lesions? <laughs> anal lesions? <laughs> By the way, it's better than the female chicks who have to hang out in the psych ward for their own condition, which is uh, can't understand new technology. 
you don't want to hang out with those chicks. <laughs> yeah. I prefer the male chicks as opposed to those female chicks you mentioned earlier. All right. So the answer is coffee, question mark. So only if you don't actually read the study. This is an article out of PLOS One from the University of Texas and the Texas Public Health System. And I want to go through the study, but I also want to be right up front with the fact that it's not the most convincing data I've ever seen, but maybe the article is a grower, not a shower. They're forthright in telling us from the start that what they were interested in was an association, not necessarily a cause, that links caffeine intake to reduced ED. The hypothesis was that caffeine, which is a potent stimulant that breaks down into vasodilators, could have a relaxing effect on the cavernous smooth muscles of the dong that could reduce ED incidence. Researchers compiled data from 2001 to 2004 and surveyed 3,724 men aged 20 and up, and they asked about dietary intake in the last 24 hours and about ED in a computer-based questionnaire. Each participant was alone in a room with a computer when asked, many men experience problems with sexual intercourse. How would you describe your ability to get and keep an erection adequate for satisfactory intercourse? The following answers apply. Would you say that you are... Always or almost always able, usually able, sometimes able, or never able. For the purpose of the study, we defined and dichotomized positive ED from the answers sometime able or never able to keep an erection. By the way, if they just want, if they wanted to make the guy feel more comfortable about talking about his ED, they should have just nicknamed his penis his family the way we did. I feel <laughs> yeah, like they really solved easier. this problem easy. <laughs> that was really a lot easier. A lot of lifestyle choices were adjusted for, including smoking, exercise, job type. Pedophilia. Right. Like a guy who's in porn isn't necessarily on the same scale as a guy who's a CPA or a guy who's trying to be a stand-up comedian but doesn't really have much else going on. And talks about it all the time. And talks about it all the time. (laughs) The results were kind of a letdown. That's what she said. There was an observed almost trend that associated higher caffeine intake with lower incidence of ED. But we're talking a p-value of 0.19, which to a scientist means basically nothing. Yeah, not very relevant. In fact, you're looking, you're looking for 05. 05 is the gold standard. In fact, in healthy men, year. there was no significant association between more caffeine and less ED. Now, what's interesting to me about this study was that the authors are very clear about each statistical analysis for each population, because they also looked at men with diabetes, men with hypertension. Um, and in those in those populations, specifically the ones with hypertension, it, it trended a little bit more. And what that means is the p-value went down a little bit, but it's still not significant. I think this is just correlational. This is the same the same dude that's going to get up early in the morning, needs to drink his coffee to go bust his ass at work. He's going to work to get that erection. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the point. Like you said, the p-value, gold standard is 0.05. Nothing reached that. N- not one s- analysis they did. The closest they get is 0.08, which can be technically called a trend, but even that has to be redone to be sure. And yet, in the discussion, the authors go on to say that they did find an inverse association between ED and caffeine intake. And guess what? So did the media. I found multiple headlines that read, two cups of coffee a day reduce the risk of erectile dysfunction, or coffee linked to reduced ED. It's a shame, because I know Damien is probably really excited about these headlines. And I'm sure many <laughs> men out there ran out and got Starbucks for the office, hoping to get the secretary from the Christmas party back on track. Dude, I'm sure many wives and girlfriends started throwing yeah. coffee in the trash like they were <laughs> sheriffs during Prohibition. Like, if I could think of the poor women that I'm around all the time, if they're like, wait, this is giving him more erections. This is out of here. <laughs> but oh, well, say, it's not. I hope he doesn't cheat. <laughs> Don't yeah, sleep with, with me, but nobody else either. With tea. <laughs> <laughs> Iced tea. Well, based on the article, it's not. And frankly, the science just doesn't get me that hard. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Jackie. And before we leave, we, of course, have our listener appreciation voicemail. This is for the groups of people in one geographic region who have subscribed the most over the last week. In this particular case, the most new subscriptions we've had has been from Denver, Colorado. So as a reward, your outgoing voicemail message from none other than Mr. Damien Mercado will commence right now. Hi, I'm comedian and big city lawyer, Damien Mercado. And you've reached the voicemail of a person from Denver. Denver, go any further east and things get really shitty for a while. Denver, the crown jewel of the Rockies, one through four. The omelet was named after the city due to barely passing the requirements to be considered good. By legalizing marijuana, the drug has been reclassified from a gateway drug to an Elway drug. Denver, located in the heart of Colorado, a state far superior to every state it touches. Denver is the only city in Colorado that isn't actually a megachurch in disguise. 
The home decor is light, who, much like the people of Colorado, are watered down and of poor quality, but are inexplicably popular. Leave a message after the beep. Denver constantly brags about having 300 days of sunshine. We in San Diego think it's cute you're counting. All right. Thank you so much for joining us for Science Faction 72. Come on back for Science Faction 73. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. 